Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm excited everyone could be here for the fourth Artists in Conversation for the Home Exhibition at Ecogedor. My name is Nicole Rademacher. Um, I am the founder and director of Ecogedor and curator of the exhibition. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, hold Um, all right, so today we have three artists whose work is in the, the in-between section of the exhibition. We have Andrea Nusch, say hi, Hello. Uh, Brand Brandon Barr, and Caroline Yu. So I'll let them talk a bit about their work in just a second. Um, but I would like to um, do a couple things. First, I would like to remind everybody who can vote in the United States or any country to vote, um, especially in the United States right now. And if you can't vote in the States, um, but know people who can, encourage them to vote. Um, I also would like to pay tribute to Justice Ruth, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and to thank her for tire tirelessly working for human rights, especially um, women's rights, because we would not be here today if it were not for the if it were not for the work that she has done or that she did. Um, and then before we get started, I do want to bring attention to the Instagram takeovers that are happening right now at acogedor.space on Instagram. Um, we have Javier Caceres Cortez. Um, he started today and he'll be going into Thursday and he's doing some really interesting interventions. And then next we have um, Jean Maquis and they, uh, they'll be starting on Friday. Uh, so more to come. Um, so let's get started with this in-between conversation. I'm gonna go first up with Brandon. I'm gonna share my screen with your, um, with your piece. And then if you could just give a little bit, um, talk a little bit about yourself and, and the work and how it relates to um, the show. All right, I'll just jump in. Um, oh, there we go, cool. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so my name is Brandon Barr. Um, I've been living in LA for about, I'm gonna say it's been about like five years or so at this point. Um, kind of have jumped across the United States. I lived um, originally from St. Louis, Missouri, um, lived in Kansas City, Missouri, have lived in New York, Mississippi, and now LA. Um, and this is uh, the work that's in the show right now. Um, so, Basically, lately, I, my work is kind of all, it's pretty mixed media. Um, I do a lot of um, sometimes interactive stuff, some augmented reality, um, things like that. But it's often, a lot of times, it's taking something, uh, pulling things from the digital world and building it into some kind of uh, 3D experience, 3D sculpture, um, or something along those lines. Or in the, on the same regard, like taking that, taking something from the physical world and bringing it into the digital space. So. Um, this work right here is just titled How I Think, um, and basically this, this, this series was from, I've just been calling it flash paintings, because um, basically to see the text on the surface of the canvas, um, you photograph it with your phone with the camera flash turned on, and then once that happens, you actually see the text um, like on the screen of your phone. So there's kind of like this physical experience that you see um, when viewing it in the actual room, and then there's like this uh, flattened version of it that brings it into the sort of like coded world of your phone, of the internet, whatever else. Um, and this one is just uh, how I think, how I am. And it's kind of this, kind of a play off of the, the, the common meme, internet meme, that's sort of um, expectation versus reality um, kind of thing. And a lot of times the text that I use or the font will kind of relate to that. So either it's the font used in different social media platforms. In this case, it's the font used for a lot of the uh, internet memes we see online today. Um, and it kind of worked well for this exhibit uh, in thinking about home and like what that means um, and having this sort of 
sort of personal world that you're sort of embedded in, but there's just kind of like the chaos happening around outside. Um, but we're able to kind of view it through, you know, the screens of our phones or computers um, and everything else. So it's kind of a play off of that, a play off some other stuff. Sometimes it's kind of like a little bit lighthearted. All the colors that get kind of like pulled into it are basically sourced from different photos online. Um, a lot of the photos I'll find online and then blur them out and then just kind of add other found colors on top of that um, to where the, the piece essentially gets kind of broken down into the color text and that kind of like original uh, image that was once there. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's the work for the show. Thanks, Brandon. There's so much I didn't even know about that. That was cool. More than what you put in your artist statement. Uh, next, I'm going to ask Andrea Nuge to um, talk a bit about her work. I'm going to, sorry, I thought I had everything organized and I did not. So let me pull up your work. Share my screen. All your <clears throat> Great, thank you. Hello, my name is Andrea Nyush. I am a mixed media artist uh, based in LA. And this piece that I created for Acogedor was um, exclusively made during COVID. I've never done these works before. Uh, it has a lot to do with my experience of being at home and finding creative ways to work under um, the quarantine, uh, I moved my studio back into my house and I got myself a sewing machine because it felt just right and, you know, along so many things that were going on and this idea of going back to basics and being resourceful and, you know, not knowing what was going to happen. Do we need to make our own masks? Do I have to mend my own clothes? And um, slowly the works, you know, I wanted to make something simple. All my works have volume and they usually like are more voluptuous. These were started as flat canvases. And um, as I was flat mixing and matching materials, eventually I, um, I really decided that I enjoyed just the thread on the canvas and it reminded me of, a, of drawing but with an in, something in between myself and the canvas. And he had a kind of a life of its own, um, which speaks a little bit of how we're living today. Things are, have lives of their own beyond us. We don't have a lot of control. So this became sort of um, a way to just let, to be here and, and watch what happens and just let the machine do it and just nudge it here and there and, and going backwards and forwards and switching the, the stitch. And, and it was a lot driven by what I was thinking, how I was feeling. Sometimes you were very simple, small lines. Sometimes it was more chaotic like this. I believe this is the, the back of the work actually that I prefer over the front of the work. So this is the other thing, it's there's a surprise that comes with making this work. So um, this is the process, this is, you know, and now I think as I move forward and they probably will become more voluptuous and intertwine and mix with other materials, but there is this series that I call Perambulando, which is a word in Portuguese for wondering. Um, I should have mentioned that in the beginning. And I think there was a lot of wondering in the house, in my mind, between the physical and the mental space, um, and how the media and how, again, the uncertainty that we're going through um, spoke to me. And I think these works represent that. So thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Um, last up, just to talk about work, and then you guys will get going on the conversation. Uh, Caroline, you're up. Oh. You were muted in the middle, but there you go. I'm sorry, you okay. were up. I'm going to share my screen. Yes. <laughs> um, so, hi, I'm Caroline. Um, I am mainly a performance artist. Uh, I 
think the sentence that sort of encompasses who I am and what I do with my work is that I really perform history and I like to uh, document or archive uh, the present. Um, all of my works definitely have this performative action in them, even if they may not be performance. Um, and a lot of my work is definitely based in my identity, you know, my race, my sexuality, um, my emotions, my cultural background. Uh, and I really like to explore, I think, this in-betweenness, um, as well as this otherness, uh, always relating, I think, to the home. Um, and so, uh, my identities, I think, my racial identities really, um, re lie in me being American, me being born here, I was born in Kansas, um, and then, uh, my sort of cultural heritage being Korean. Um, so it was really interesting in COVID, uh, uh, I was in LA, been there for about three years, and then because of the COVID situation, decided to move back to Korea, um, during the midst of COVID, I think in June, and uh, was really thinking about these two different homes, America and Korea, um, and sort of my identities between them. Um, I was quite physically changing homes. Um, and the two neon signs are uh, how I think these culturals view me in a very outwardly aspect. So in America, it's very much my skin color, uh, Asian American, yellow, Asian, um, and always this sort of branding of this foreigner that sort of always follows me because of my skin color. And um, even though I do have American citizenship, and then in Korea, because I'm also a dual citizen, I have Korean citizenship, but because I was born in America, even though I'm completely fluent in Korean, my accent and um, sometimes my vocabulary as well, well as the way that I dress, obviously very much informs other people in Korea that I am American or too much American for them. So the sign in Korean actually translates to American. Um, so they're both slurs in the society that was in um, I was also really thinking about quarantining when I was putting these photos together. Um, in America, there's a very layman's terms of quarantining. It's not really quarantining, like you're allowed to go out and take a walk if you have like a dog or, um, you know, you can meet people um, like in your home, just six feet apart. Like I think it's a very loose term of quarantining versus Korea, it's very much um, very strict. Like you come into the country, like you have to download an app. Um, the government official checks in with you through this app twice a day. If you don't tell them your temperature or um, how you're feeling, they will contact you. If they can't contact you, they will go to um, your emergency contact. And if your emergency contact doesn't contact you, then they'll really come to your door. So um, thinking about these really two different quarantine styles, um, as well as the political implications of both of them, um, was something that I was really thinking about for, I think, this exhibition. Thanks, Caroline. All right, there was, there was a lot more than you guys wrote in your artist statements or what we talked about in that prep meeting. Um, there's a couple things that, so this control thing that um, Andrea was talking about, I think also the intersection with Kansas in the Midwest, which I didn't, maybe it came up, but I just missed it when we were doing the pre. And then this idea of um, visibility of you not belonging through dress or skin, skin color or other cultural traits. Um, so I'm gonna throw those three ideas out there on top of what we already talked about. Um, I don't know if Caroline, if you wanna, go first with these ideas and then I'll leave it to the artists. Yeah, um, did all of us sort of, uh, are we all sort of, have we been through Kansas in some sort of ways? No, I, it's funny because- You um, and Brandon though, right? I, yeah, yes. well, I, lived, I, I lived in Kansas City, Missouri, but it was right on the border. So I was like, I don't know, it's like 10 minutes from Kansas, but I would go there all the time. Okay, that so, was mine. My, no, my. but it's 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 actually really funny because 
Brandon said that he was from St. Louis and I went to school in St. Louis. So that was really funny when he brought that up. But um, like just a little bit of my background, like I was born in Kansas, but sort of raised all over the United States. I spent like my formative years in like the East Coast. Um, and then my mom moved to Atlanta. So I lived in the South for a little bit. And then I went to school, obviously in the Midwest, um, back in St. Louis. And then I moved to LA. And then now because of my grad school, I'm back in Pennsylvania. So <laughs> um, it's sort of this uh, having to, I think, situate yourself in all of these different cities that definitely have complete different just politics in every sense of form, <laughs> whether it be racial, cultural, or just um, embedded things that are in these societies that, um, like for example, like LA is definitely so much slower than the East Coast is. Like you can't, that pacing is so different. Um, and then there's also like Midwestern hospitality, but the Midwest also has a lot of racial segregation to put it in the least. Um, and so I think, I know something that we talked about in the prep that was really interesting is sort of, uh, what is, what is the home constitute for all of us and this in-betweenness? Um, also, uh, what is a home? Is it a city? Does a hometown really matter anymore? Um, I don't know. I'd love to have this just like a loose conversation with everyone about this. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, I, I, we kind of had a good conversation before about that, and um, I didn't know you went to school in, in St. Louis, though. What school was it? It was uh, Washington University in St. Louis, so. Oh, yeah, that's an awesome school. Um, yeah, it's, it's like a different world, like, uh, it was same like, a, I lived there, East Coast, and then, like, Mississippi in the South, and then on the West Coast, and, like, they are all just their own different, like, microcosms of the way people interact in the street um to the way this like the entire like city is run and everyone carries themselves um it's very drastic and different and it's it is weird kind of it's it's i think it's great to actually see them all like to experience them all it gives you a good perception of like what makes up most of the country um and especially when it comes like you know like after living out in on the west coast and stuff it's you realize that there's just like this large uh, chunk of the country that just is much different than what's out here. Um, but yeah, uh, Andrea, if you want to jump in. Sure. Um, well, as an immigrant from Brazil, um, I, I lived most of my life in the East Coast. So the U.S. for me uh, New York was everything I loved and wanted. And as I guess a New Yorker, I don't want to speak for everyone else. Like, I didn't need to go anywhere else. <laughs> I was just happy to be there. I came through Chicago as an exchange student in the 90, early 90s. So I, you know, connect with you in the Midwest. And, and that left a great impression. And that made me want to move here because the kindness and the diversity that I saw in Chicago, although segregated, there was a lot of diversity and it felt like, a, I didn't know at the time, but a smaller, more manageable New York. Um, and uh, so that, you know, that gave me the impression. And then when I moved, while there, I went to New York for a week and that was, this is it, you know, this is home. And I knew at nine, 18 that I needed to live in that place. And I found my way through college and eventually, but I have this love and hate relationship with Miami, you know, things would happen and I go, went back. So I, as an immigrant, I always navigated the very Latin side of the US on the East Coast. So um, it was very hard to break into the American culture. Uh, and it's a particular Latin, Southern Latin, it's like Colombian under, it's not the Northern Latin, which is more California. So I learned all these things, you know, Miami is very Cuban, New York is, so the Latin culture became a little bit of my home here and Spanish became like almost a first, second language and I navigated and um, 
Yeah, and I've been thinking a lot about the concept of home, and then I lived in New York, in Miami three times, in New York twice, and the last time we were between LA and New York, and because we have kids, we ended up in LA, and agreed with that the weather was better. Um, yeah, you know, you have to negotiate sometimes with your partner, and uh, and and yeah, and once you travel so much and you move so much and, and your actually original home is not a choice, as if you're following the news, my country is beautiful yet challenging. Um, I have to carry the home with me. And this is what I learned, you know, I am the home and, and I have to build this and kind of replicate it everywhere I settle. And, and I know this is not my final stop. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I think that's really beautiful, like carrying a home with you. I think that's definitely like my definition of a home too, just because um, like for me, I was never really accepted in like the East or the West. And um, so not being able to place myself, but then constantly being moved around with my family and having to, like, for example, my body in the South is very different than my body in like Northeastern United States. Um, just because the South, Atlanta's, Atlanta's okay, but the outskirts of Atlanta, like you still have Confederate flags. Um, and so it, it's a very different relationship to um, the Eastern Asian body than maybe it is in New York. Um, and so I think having moved around a lot, it became very clear to me that I would not be able to sort of pinpoint like a home, like, oh, um, you know, Atlanta is my home, St. Louis is my home, and realizing that you do have to carry yourself. Um, and I also love this idea of how the home, I think for me, changes each time I go to a different city, just because of that city's own cultural or sort of social um, essences. Uh, like I think also just uh, thinking about Andrea as like how um, Latin America is so different everywhere. It's the same for like Eastern Asian America or Korean American. So in LA, there's a huge K-Town, like there's definitely a social and economic acceptance of Korean culture. But in New York, even though people still like K-Barbecue and K-Pop, you know, I could be going down the street of like Chinatown and people will still call me chink to this day. And it's um, it, because it's just like a different sort of um, social sphere and i could get that in la as well but it's just more often i think in the east coast even though they're bigger cities and they're considered diverse yeah and one thing i learned is that you know proximity to the outside world influences you know i lived in k-town in new york city i lived on 30th between fifth and sixth uh fifth and broadway which was considered the bottom of k-town so that was home part, you know, going back to New York and having Bibim Bop on 32nd Street and having what we call perfect bread is home too, you know? And, um, and we noticed that the East New York is very European focus and the West Coast is more Asian focused. So I think that's where you get a little bit, you know, because of, I think also proximity uh, of where the influx of immigrants went to um, and, and I never, I actually never thought I would live in the West Coast. I thought I was going to die. You know, I lived in my, in a building with ladies who died at 103 and 105. And I was like, that'll be me. I'm never going to leave this place. And, and I may still go back and end up there, you know, but it's, it's fascinating. I think the U S is fascinating. And a point to Brandon, I really find LA quite Midwest-ish. Hmm. There is something about it that it's more than New York, which makes really? it nicer. Yeah, Midwest nice. There is a, there's a niceness about the, you know, that we notice coming here, like from Miami, when we will visit, we'll be like, oh, everybody's so nice. They talk to you on the line of the supermarket. Not, it's like best friends, you know, but like it's pleasant. Yeah, I, I, could, I could see that, I think. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's like, I think it's like a different, it's like a different kindness. Like I think in the, um, like the Midwest, it's just kind of like, you're just kind of, I guess, raised to carry yourself in a certain way. 
Whereas out here, I think sometimes um, people just like, they just want to engage. They want to like, there's just like this a desire to interact more um, in some, some situations. Uh, but I could see that there is, there is like, um, well, I think a lot of, a lot of times as people that live out here are, are, there's a lot of transplants to begin with. So you might actually have already a lot of people from the Midwest. I've, I know a lot of people that I have kind of met with and become friends with aren't really from here. Like they're from all over the, all over the country. So, um, which I think in a way it's good because it kind of, you know, you're kind of forced into this very tight, um, busy city and you, you either have to find the the best aspects of yourself to utilize in public. Otherwise you just won't be able to carry on for very long. You know what I mean? Like, um, it's like the traffic here, like is obviously terrible, but I, sometimes I feel like because you're, you're, you have no choice, but to sort of like learn to exist in that environment that you're kind of forced to be like, I'm, you have to be courteous. Like you, you have to let that person go first uh you know like otherwise it's just going to be chaos with like a second um whereas like in other situations like in, in the midwest there's like some smaller towns that it's it, it can be kind of the opposite because there's like um less people i think there's more room for like you can make a decision it can go one way or the other um it's just kind of like more room for that but when you're kind of uh, in a larger city it feels like you either have to get along and be friendly or it'll just be like a miserable experience. I've, I think I've kind of like, I've realized that in some ways. But it's amazing sometimes when you navigate the city and just think like, you'll just pass like hundreds of people like on the highway and the roads. And then it gets to the point where it's like mind boggling. Like you're just like, there's so many people in this city that I've driven past in the past like 15 minutes. Um, and it somehow was still working. Like people are still moving about and carrying on and like being civil to a certain degree um obviously that can go south pretty quick but like yeah it's it's kind of amazing in certain ways it's because you've never driven in miami <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> let's try that someday oh here it is like i mean the first year i would always drive and i'll be like oh i gotta turn now and i'll be like oh my god oh my god and people just you know i mean i'm sure they're gonna hate me but i was like i wish i had a new york plate right now <laughs> <laughs> but there is there there is it's almost there's a code there is an agreement you know you always get one you know you may get somebody here and there but i think there's an understanding that you're going to screw up you know and people let you go and yeah i think there's a lot about la that um is very interesting and it's very isolating at the same time so it's it's different than New York where you walk and you see people. And even if you don't have any friends, you know the UPS delivery guy who he comes to your door. <laughs> you know, like, I still remember him. Or you become best friends with your super. I mean, he still calls us after, what, six years to check in on us. And, um, and those are very precious, you know, relationships that you build. Um, and that also create a sense of home. Uh, living, I live in a house now and it's isolating, you know, it's like, you may never see anyone. So again, I think the concept of going back is what is home for you. You know, for me, home is having these relationships that remind me that I belong. Like home for me, like having that conversation with you, the prep convo made me feel at home. I felt like, okay, I have a community. I have people that are like-minded, even though it's on Zoom. So I think now we're adjusting the concept as well, right? Yes, I totally agree. I think home is very much connected to people and community, at least um, for me. And, and again, community can mean all sorts of things. But um, for example, even in Korea, my dad lives in Korea. Most of my family, other than my mom, lives in Korea. Um, but Korea is still very alienating to me just because I didn't grow up there and because people see me as other. It's just, um, even though I do have a lot of friends in Korea, a lot of close friends in Korea, um, it just never feels like home. Um, or there are aspects about it that I think feels like home, but it just doesn't feel right. But I think in LA, where um, I think the first two years were brutal because LA has a lot of different pockets of <laughs> communities that you, and like, like Brandon said, it's very 
um like everybody just like it's a very what is it like people stop by and then they leave so it's a very fast changing city so these communities are constantly changing as well um but then when i finally found my community my performance group like the people that really understood me um that made up for like the two years in LA. Yeah, I, and I want to bring up, you, you talk about home and just like a, an outside perspective for somebody who, you know, I never realized that I, I looked more American than I felt. Um, and I spent 20 years here thinking that I was the other, right? And I was surprised, Carolyn, to think, to hear your experience. I just did not know. I thought that if you had a passport, you were born here, <laughs> you're American and you were accepted. You know, to me, it was like, I was always in the, oh my God, I don't have papers. You know, they're gonna kick me out. They're gonna let, let me back in into the country. Every time traveling was stressful, um, you lose your job. You, if you didn't have a green card, you have to leave. So I, um, it took me a long time to get out of my fear, my bubble of otherness, you know, and, not, and thinking that I never fit in, uh, that Americans didn't understand me, my sense of humor, you know, uh, the concept of code switching. Somebody was talking about it the other day and I was like, I am myself and I'm gonna be myself. I have to be myself, but I was like, wait a minute. People switch codes here, whatever they go. I didn't know that. Um, so I'm working on my code switching now after 25 years. So these are all things, maybe people didn't talk about it 20 years ago, but these are all things that interfere and we don't know the world of each individual as they are navigating their experience. Yeah, I would, no, I totally agree with that. And um, I think that's something that I think a lot, a lot of people have become very aware of uh, finally in a lot of situations in the past like three months is like, um, you don't know everyone's experience like around you. So it's like, you just like, just, you know, don't, don't be an ass, just be like, assume that everyone's going through something. Obviously everyone is right now. Um, so it's it's kind of crazy and like you know i was thinking of um i actually went to brazil for like a show like years ago and on my way back in so like going there was 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 fine like <laughs> i you know got through like security and stuff um and made it to brazil all was all was good but then like coming back in to the united states was like a totally different experience that I mean you would get drilled like at if you went up to like when you're they're checking your passport like they would just drill you with questions security was just way more intense and like vigorous uh there was just like a dehumanization that was like happening and it's like you know I can give them my passport they see that I'm American and everything else but there's still just like the sense you're coming from a, another country they don't even care it's just like that's the persona they put on coming right into it and that was a really like big eye-opening experience I was just like my god I can't imagine somebody that is generally from some of these countries trying to come in to the United States and find a citizenship and like for work, whatever, or school, whatever else, uh, and have to deal with that like 24 seven. It's, it's crazy. Um, and yeah, it was like a, it was like a pretty like eye opening experience and it puts everything in, into perspective and, um, in good and bad ways for sure. Completely. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Um, I just wanted to say, like, like, going off of both of your points, I think um, it's really interesting because, like, I, when was this, five years ago, I, I got dual citizenship. I was always an American citizenship. I had the American papers, and then I was able to get the Korean papers because the law changed. But it's really interesting because whenever I go to Korea, um, because the law that was made that enables me to become a dual citizen is very, very specific and it's not advertised because the Korean government doesn't want a lot of dual citizens. Um, so whenever I go through immigration, 
and they give me such a hard time because they're like, you have to pick either your American citizenship or your Korean citizenship. You can't be both. And then I have to explain to them on immigration, no, this is the law. It has changed. And then they'll always like bring their superiors in and like, and then it becomes like a 30 minute office sort of situation where I get dragged into like a small office with like immigrant nation officers. And it's really funny because I have both papers. I have legitimate sort of validation for both countries to access both countries. But even with this validation, I'm still being questioned because of uh, the access to both or this like in-betweenness. And so I think it's really interesting that you brought up that experience, Brendan, because like I, whenever I go through immigration in Korea, I'm like, it would have been so much easier if I was just a foreigner rather than a national. And um, just, I think questions like that always bring up like, what is really the meaning of these papers? Like pretty much nothing. Um, other than for, I think probably the government to track us. <laughs> but that's a whole different topic. I'm gonna interrupt for a second. Um, I'm loving this and so, so are some of the people on Facebook too. And I think um, it's really important to talk about these, how we experience this, especially um, as foreigners and nationals and citizens and not. Um, but artist Jerry Allen, who's also part of the show is watching and they, um, they wanna hear more about your specific um, work in the show and how it relates to home. So I'll be kind of addressed that a little bit in the beginning. And so I'm wondering if maybe we can kind of thread it through because there are, and we talked about this a little bit in the prep because there are lots of similarities in how you thought about home um, doing your work. So how we thought about home doing the work. Um, so, I think your work was actually done before the call, but um, so it's different. So like if you saw the call and then did the work or if you did the work and then saw the call and then realized the similarity. So how that work, how that, how the work works, um, but how the artwork um, relates to home and, and also then relates to the in-betweenness within it. Can I take a stab? Um, I did the work before um, but when I saw the call, it really um, spoke to me in the sense that since the work first was done during, you know, lockdown and the concept of how I did the work, which was letting the machine run and wonder by itself as much as I could related to my wondering inside the home, you know, like you, you know, there's a spot that you stick around and you you know, there's area, like everybody found my favorite chair. I think I have a favorite chair where I sit down and I do my calls. I'm not doing it today, but normally there's a, there are spots in the house. There were like periods and waves during that in the beginning, you know, like in the beginning, we were like all down reading the news, reading the news, getting really worried, really, you know, and then you like go through a period in which it's like, okay, What's the plan? Okay, I'm gonna sit around for two months and wait. In two months, I reassess. Stop reading the news, keep going around, figure out your life, you know, cook, go to the market, put everything. And then, and to me, um, the work speaks to that, you know, like the, 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 the circulating, the, 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 the circles we were in and are in trying to make sense of what's going on while locked at home. And also the, the in-between is between switching between the physical and the mental. So yeah, you have the physical constraints, right? Going from room to room. Some people live in a studio. Some people have no family. Some people have family need to figure out, can I see them versus what's going on in your mind? And how do you come, you know, to terms with what you're thinking and, and worrying versus the science, which side are you taking? Is it BS, is not BS? So this is just basically letting the machine follow this kind of process. I hope I answered. Um, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll go next. 
Um, uh, yeah, I think like I know with I produced my work before the the open call, but the that I chose that piece specifically because of I guess kind of the context in which it was made, which is like um, again playing off of that the internet meme sort of expectation versus reality, um, and that's I think for one I think our communication and our interaction has existed so much online right now that it's like we kind of communicate our thoughts and feelings about the pandemic in general just through memes. Um, I think it's like a, a pretty common thing you'll see on a day-to-day -day basis and also just the idea of what that means like um, you know I think how I think how I am can mean a lot of different things but in this in this case I kind of like the way of it thinking about it like um, you know how I think I'm doing on a daily basis how I'm actually feeling or there's kind of like it's playing with this idea of like what this sort of like personal experience I'm having in my home each day where I'm sort of like playing out my work studio personal life and all that while at the same time there's all this kind of um all this external stuff that's happening outside of my my own home um so in in my own comfortable comfortable space I may be doing this or that that's pretty easy going but then you open up your phone and there's some kind of there's a new headline that's showing some kind of awful event that's taking place outside and um so again that's kind of what kind of drew me to that work for the show and then again that's just kind of uh that piece itself is kind of playing with this idea of like what's in between those two those two worlds your your uh personal life and what you want to be what you expect to be but then what you actually are what's actually happening outside um yeah and also just like a point on brandon's work that i love because i realized that it was through the flash that these words were activated was also how mm, most of the world really sort of leans or um like understands the world through vision right like through skin color through these labels through um these contexts but there's so much more like you said invisible things um that we can't access through just sight um but yeah just quick thoughts but um so my work uh was so i sort of had the two imagery done um separately i didn't really know i was going to collage them and then um the my friend Akela Tangi, who's also in the show, um, sort of texted me the information on this call and was like, this is perfect for your work. Um, Cause a lot of my work really deals on this belonging of the home. Um, and I was sort of just looking through, maybe I should, you know, um, input something that I had already done uh, or had done during like the COVID times, but I wanted to do, I think at that time I was actually, I think when I submitted it was during my quarantine in Korea. So I was very much thinking um, about the physicality of these homes and being stuck in this apartment alone in Korea that my dad had recently moved. So I had never been in this place before. And then, but this was like my home on my ID and my Korean sort of papers when coming into the country. But then the foreignness of this place, um, and so I was really thinking about like home spatially. I also was thinking about like what, how, how for me, I always, even though there are other nisses that are thrown at me in both countries, I always, um, sometimes I feel like I fit more in the West. And I think that's just because certain cultural norms aren't as familiar to me in Korea. Um, in Korea, it's still a very patriarchal country, as is America, but more so than America. Um, and uh, we still adhere to a lot of Confucian values of how women should be, how we should look, how we should act, what is proper. Um, and I think a lot of that feels constricting to me in, um, in my home in Korea. So I think I was also thinking about how this space in Korea was so foreign. There was this like sort of um, these walls, like these cages. And America, I also have these racial cages that are attached to me, but um, sometimes it seems a little bit more um, accessible to one, what I want to be in all of my identity sometimes. 
so I was really thinking, I think about this in betweenness of homes and my two identities, as well as sort of how, like what Brandon and Andrea was saying, um, how people sort of see you one way, but you identify as another, but people can't get over the way that they view you. <laughs> and um, so I think that's how my work was really sort of fabricated during this. So definitely the prompt was making my wheels turn. Yeah, I mean, I, I can, I totally see that in that work as well. And um, I mean, just that, just that word alone, foreigner is something that I think has been such a, you know, there's been heightened awareness around that, even throughout this pandemic and COVID and like where it originated from, um, things like that. And then just sort of like all the uh, like racial unrest that's been prevalent, you know, in the past uh, few months. I mean, I would say years, but definitely the, the past few months. And um, I think that speaks on like multiple levels if you start to think about what you've been seeing like in the news and everything else lately. Yeah, definitely. And one thing like bringing the home to this topic, um, what do you think about the fact that everybody was home when all these things were happening? How, you know, I think that influenced or helped amplify right it's not that it was one more video that surfaced people were like watching it and it's you know it's it's interesting that when it rains it pours right and but i think the fact that we had we had to see it people had to think about it people had to start reading books because life was not you know i think we were living as usual all the time and this made us stop and really think about it. So I'm grateful for the space that was created for us to face what needs to be faced that we didn't do for a long time. It's, it's just kind of just an interesting comment that if we were living life as usual, would it have had the same impact, you know, if we were not at yes. home? Yes. Also like how, for a lot of people, home had completely changed because of COVID. Like a lot of people were displaced. A lot of people had to move back in with their families or take care of someone or financially wasn't able to continue the way that they were able, like were living. Like that was the case for me. Like I could not live in LA with the sort of cuts and layoffs that were happening in the art world and my jobs. And so it was easier for me to think about living with my dad on the other side of the world where I had like a fully stocked fridge, you know, <laughs> rather than um, LA. But then it's also like, I, I know for a lot of people um, who had to move back home or had to go care for somebody, it was because you were so trapped at home, like the feeling of foreignness in this new home, but you're home all the time. Yeah, and I, I think that can also bring out, um, I was telling somebody about this today, like I think it brings out a lot of the like internal turmoil in people, I think comes out when you are sort of like main, like being kept in your own space. And there's also just a lack of just general human interaction, like physical interaction and just like passing people on the street that whether you, even if you're an introverted person, I think you still feed off of that. And it's still like a life force for humans in general. So like to completely kind of all of a sudden cut that off for people, I think it's like, um, it has caused a lot of like really um, different like reactions and uh, things in people that make them, that it's kind of bringing up all this sort of like internal things, like problems. And then, then once you once it started to like ease back up and people started to go back out into the street, it just people felt just more on edge in general um, because they didn't have that kind of day to day interaction with with other people and and I think definitely with all like the like racial unrest and stuff that was happening, I think that I think being at home really fueled that because 
it it gave people were like you were saying Andrea, like people were sort of forced to face that and think about it and either you thought about it and you didn't like it and you kind of your sort of like internal racism started to come out um or you saw what was happening and you were forced to be like oh man i have to make a change and i saw like people like you're saying people were like forced to start reading books and like um you know start to realize talk about like white privilege and all this different stuff and um again that like you're saying that probably wouldn't have happened if we were out doing our day to day because we've been too busy driving you know hour and a half to work each day and like too tired to do anything when we got back and um yeah it's just like all this stuff kind of happened uh kind of in a way right place right time you know um that sparked it and made it become this major major discussion which gives me hope that we hopefully will learn something from this <laughs> fingers I crossed yeah i wanted to bring something that we discussed that um I kept thinking about if we have time. Uh, uh, you brought up, Carolyn, the, the hyphen space. Somebody mentioned the hyphen space yesterday during the pandemic, pandemics. <laughs> and I think it was one of the winners. And I was like, oh, that's a concept. I mean, I learned that with you and, you know, uh, and I was like, what is my hyphenation? You know, I was born in Brazil. I've been here for 25 years. I, am I a Brazilian Americana? Am I an American Brazilian? Because I always say I'm Brazilian. And um, so I don't know how does that influence. And you are like a Midwestern LA or, you know, like the hyphen doesn't have to just be because you're from a different country. How do you feel about it? And how do, maybe has that influenced your work? Yeah, I love the hyphen space. Um, like Andrea was talking about this, the Korean American, American Korean, but then also um, like, you know, it's like, like the thinking about like emotions and like what, what are things that you sort of geared towards in your life, like people who clean a lot versus, you know, like you can be a clean person, but then also have a super messy car and that can be hyphenated. Um, so I think these spaces are really interesting. I really think it's um, obviously something that was always there, but it's more accessible because we're globalizing more, um, because there are so many different access points through the internet as well. Like, for example, um, when I wanted to watch Korean TV or um, maybe like, Japanese animation like Miyazaki when I was younger, you had to go to like a video shop and then get something pre-recorded for Korean TV shows that was then flown in from Korea sometimes and then on like a store that you like went in and then you got for a week and then you got to see and then you returned. But for like Miyazaki films, sometimes like in Delaware at Blockbuster, it's hard to find a Miyazaki film. And so it's, but now everything's on Netflix. You can um, stream things and research things. So I think we've created, like the internet has created a culture where you can access things a lot more easily. So you can be a person in the Midwest who has never come across Asian, Asian culture, but be in love with anime or be in love with um, certain types of Asian culture. and. And this in-betweenness and this hybridity that a lot of people are forming is so interesting to me because I think it talks about not one way of life, but trying multiple avenues of life. And how do we sort of, because I feel like for, at least in the West, in like the early 2000s, late 90s, it was definitely like you assimilate or you like you sort of die. Like there's, there's no really um, other way to put it. And now it's still, you still have to assimilate. I mean, white culture is the culture, but it's less so. Like you can be, uh, like you can have different identities and different forms of being with a lot more acceptance, which I think is something really beautiful and something that people should lean into more rather than being like, I am just American. I am Korean. I am a clean freak. Like, Uh, yeah, no, I totally agree. I think that, I mean, it's kind of like general globalization and, you know, the world has allowed for that. Um, 
and we I think we were also talking about that idea of like hyphenation or like is the in between does that then become like its own box you know like we were kind of talking about that like if you are identifying as these two things does that identity in that middle space become its own sort of label and stuff and it's in a way um you know if it's it's constantly changing too so like i think because you do have so much access to whatever you want and you can find any kind of interest you want um that i know for me like just i think my art in general has changed a lot because i do um there's just so much that I that's that's there. There's so much like options there. That's hard for me to stick in like one avenue of like, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna work in like painting over here. Or, like, like I, I there's like so much to kind of take in and process that, um, you know, it's hard to kind of just stay in that single box. But I think that same same thing can kind of kind of be said about identity and that uh, people might, you know, as as they're age and grow older even your what you identify with or what you're interested in and what part of the world that came from might even change and shift um there's still remnants of it which is really cool but yeah i think that any kind of like having access to all of that it just kind of like it makes the overall experience of uh i guess maybe just not to talk so grand but being human is it makes it richer because you do have um access and it's opening up what you think of as being an individual um, uh, and your identity can change and shifts in different ways. And like, that's a good thing. And like that shifting should be accepted and like maybe even encouraged in some, for some people. I agree. I think, I mean, it's a whole nother conversation. I'm, I just, I'm starting to think that people are hyper hyphenating themselves in a way. Um, and, uh, you know, I come from, you know, assimilate, you have to have, you believe certain things, you are a certain way, you wear certain things, you have a style, right? <laughs> I think this new generation now is searching for, and then I noticed like late nineties, early two, like 2000 started to shift like individuality, right? Like I want to have my own expression and then we're culminating now in which is like, hyphenating gender, you know, gender is a big thing on identity. And um, the only thing that worries me is that are we falling into the same trap again for over hyphenating in a point that we're so individualized that we're gonna be like, oh, you don't have my hyphen. So do we have anything in common? Do you know what I mean? Like, I think the point is more to be like, okay, today I'm this, tomorrow I'm that. And today I'm doing painting, tomorrow I'm doing, it's like, the essence is there, right? You're creating and you're being. Um, I just worry that the current generation is over analyzing and creating a new existential problem where there isn't. But um, my point is like, I think it's great to identify with multiple things, but stay, stay fluid, right? In the sense that you're not married to anything at any time. You can change your style, right? Yes, definitely. Like, I, I completely agree on fluidity. Um, but just to push back a little, I even if you're hyper individualized, something that I've come to recently that I know this group already knows because of our prep um, session is even if you're hyper individualized, um, you can still fall back into, I think, a collective mi mindset. I think what's really beautiful about um, creating these different modes of hybridity is that that you're of you're creating sort of this new identity for yourself but that doesn't mean you're alienating yourself from these different i think um collectives whether it be cultural or um or societal um like for example in um korea i've always sort of um had a distaste for how collective the mindset is you know like you have to be a certain way like you said it's it's very patriarchal like as a woman you have to fall in line it's very like there are certain things that just never sat well with me um but then when i went for covid and i went during the height of sort of in la when blm was resurging again and like the national guard came in in early june and i had left and like 
LA at that time, like we had curfews at like 5 p.m., 6 p.m. And, and, um, and everybody was so scared that all of this police, police brutality would really infringe upon our like, in, like independent rights. Um, but then I went to Korea and it's the complete opposite. Like if you are a national of Korea, you have to download this app that tracks your every movement. Like every time in Korea, like for example, even outside of quarantine, um, like the government tracks you. So if, like if you have, like if somebody that you've co come across in paths has tested positive for COVID, they send out like a, like a national blurb in your area or your city where it's like this person has gone through this this and this route so you can track if there was any overlap at any time and that's a huge infringement on security in american ways of thinking i would have never allowed i think that part of myself to allow that before covid but having given up all of that privacy, I understood very quickly, like in the first day, that this was the only way that Korea was doing so well with the COVID situation. By the time that I come back in Korea in August, there were only 66 positive countries, 66 positive cases of COVID in the whole country. Um, so like some cities only had one positive case of COVID and everybody was wearing masks and people were freaking out when there were like two positive cases versus America where we have like thousands and thousands of people who have COVID. And, and it was a very quick realization for me that this collective mindset was not a bad thing. It was, it was a way for protection. It was a way that people understood that life means more than death, which I'm not sure I can say that for the American government right now. Yeah, yeah. As, uh, as I was say, I think it's interesting to think about the like that collective mindset that you experience in Korea versus like the individual mindset because I like again that's that then that's kind of creating these two ideas of like um, there's it's one or the other, you know. Like I feel like in the United States, this I, this individualism, this idea of like this kind of cavalier attitude of like you can't tell me what to do kind of thing. Um, in, in like a lot of ways is like, it's just kind of like this false sense of like, I guess maybe insecurity, is maybe the better word to say it's insecurity, but like this false sense of insecurity that like, oh yeah, it's, this is, these are my rights. You can't tell me what to do. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to make these decisions for myself when in reality, like, no, you have to do this. Like it's, it's about thinking about your life and existence as a whole. You know, it's like, if you're part, if you're a human being, you're part of like, the human species and like you have to take into account everybody um because currently like you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for everyone else around you so stop thinking about yourself so much and focus on you know what's what's happening but it's like at the same time it's like you can go to one extreme or the other um but i think even in even in like this co in a collective society or something like uh like korea um where you do kind of everyone's kind of like thinking and working together did you find that there still was like, you know, there's, there's obviously like people are still being themselves. They're still kind of carrying on and they have individual identities. It's just sort of like, it, was it more of like this kind of a like national mindset or just, was there like a certain level that at a certain point people had to, had to start taking into consideration everyone else? Or was it, did you find that some people would push back the same way that would happen in the United States? Mm, again because like I wasn't there for like the full COVID situation because COVID happened in Korea earlier than the United States just because our closer was to China so I think they started like late February again I may not be completely correct because I was not there but um, from my view having an Americanized perspective and having family and just understanding the news through family and seeing news a little bit on um, the web and such I felt that it was very much a national mindset. Like it was, it was kind of crazy to me when I found out, yes, there were like government facilities that shut down because of COVID, like the museums and sort of the parks because of the COVID spread. But um, there was no sort of, there was no, there was never any curfew 
or there was never any sort of like really big legal movements that was like you have to stay home like I know in LA it was very much like that at one point um where it was like like you have to stay home unless it's like absolutely essential you cannot leave um and that was never really the case in Korea it felt like it was just everybody understood that you were putting other people at risk obviously there were certain businesses like there was this case where um there was like a clubbing incident where a club opened up um and a lot of people came and it sort of the COVID cases really spread because of that one person there and then um and then obviously sort of the club scene really like shut down for a while afterwards um and that was definitely more of governmental pressure but then sort of afterwards like the clubs were like clubs were opening um but nobody was going because it's like you don't want that spread versus i heard from like my friends that there was like one day in la that the bars were open and like everybody went and there were so many cases and so obviously there are like different um mindsets and you know just um it's definitely a collective collective versus individual mentality and i think um especially here i think it's lack of knowing history it's lack of understanding how other cultures operate and and lack of under you know i think it's a whole other conversation again but um but this is why here and brazil I, I've been joking around with my friends that we're like, we're young colonies, right? Like we're going through a teenage individualization time in our existential history. If you compare to Europe or, you know, Northern, like Asia, we're very young. And I think we're making serious mistakes and um, hopefully we'll learn at some point <laughs> from the elders. <laughs> Yeah, and no, I, I totally agree. And I, I, like, I, I would hope that maybe out of, out after this, like the pandemic, when we're all kind of experiencing the same thing, that those two ideas, like the idea of being an individual and the idea of being part of a collective can sort of coexist at the same time. Like, that could be something that could just be discussed more and accepted more that like, um, yeah, in order for you to be an individual, like, and remain safe and healthy, like you have to then consider yourself part of like this larger collective of people um which just comes down to like basic human empathy you know it's like it shouldn't it, in a lot of cases like it shouldn't be that shouldn't be that hard but people still kind of struggle with it and um hopefully yeah hopefully in the end it's something that's realized and accepted more as like we can be both of these things and it'll everyone will be sort of better because of it you know and the same place for racism right it's the same concept that we're struggling you know we're struggling with all the same things because there is you know i joke another thing that i i think a lot about is this pursuit of happiness that we have i read as pursuit of individual happiness that we justify for you know our success and i would love to change it to in pursuit of collective happiness if i had any power because once it trickles down, people will learn in school, at home, but maybe it was in the original founder's idea, but it wasn't expressed <laughs> very fully. So, you know, that's my suggestion. It's a very, very lenient view of founders, <laughs> like the founder's mindset. <laughs> but, yeah, you're giving them a lot of credit, Andrea. Yeah. <laughs> you're muted. Um, I have to know my limitations in American history. I just make, you know, a comment based on what I know. Well, if you guys haven't already, please read or listen to Howard Zinn's The People's History of the United States. <laughs> And then you'll learn that what we really know deep inside intuitively is true. They're just white, wealthy men, landowning men. Yeah. yeah. Ugh. <laughs> but 
and also I think but it's it's really interesting because I think like all the powers at least in the west have very much created this like Brandon and Andrea were saying the sense of the binary like why does everything have to be one or the other like where is the in between which is why I think everyone has been just be reiterating it's nothing is ever one or the other and I don't know why our brain is wired like that it's probably the capitalist just white men <laughs> knowing that this is a way to control by not creating an in-between for us so that we always have to pick a side and just fight but and I don't know it it like I like Andre said I would love collective happiness that would be the best scenario it is a social construct you know that that has been embedded culturally not just here i think you know it is it came from europe it came from you know other societies you know but um but we can change it it's taking a while but i think you're the there is a big push now for the in between us um and and yeah we just have to to be it i think the communities find themselves but live under lived for too long underground and um and it's great to see, you know, a lot of young, you know, for my my generation, people are like, oh, this child's having a, you know, uh, decided to change gender at 13, 14. And I'm like, well, maybe that's what makes them here. You know, who am I to judge? So I think it's changing and fast. So just hopefully people find their their path, you know. Yeah, and I think just, uh, you know, this idea of like um, division and like this binary approach to things is definitely fueled by our two party system. I mean, that's like the, the prime example. And that's actually what feeds a lot of the a lot of the racism and problems, you know, it's like one side or, or someone from that one side will do something that triggers the other side and then it gets back and forth. And I mean, like, Trump is currently using the old like divide and conquer technique as we speak right now. So it's like, yeah, I mean, the two party system in general is complete garbage to begin with, but that it, that does, I think in itself creates so many problems um, that it, it's gonna be hard to kind of like recover from because it's been happening for so long uh, that yeah, it's like I, I would hope that eventually somewhere down the road it would change. Um, but it would just take such like a long kind of like recovery and like rethinking um, and adjusting for people in America, you know? Yeah, it takes a generation or two, you know, we're, we're going through a big period now of which the baby boomers are manifesting their, their power and their will of keeping the status quo. I think that's how I see it. Um, and so we have to take a long view as we vote, as you know, and not get frustrated, even if you get what you want, but they don't do what you expect, because it's a long, it's a long arc. And, uh, and I, the only thing I wanted to say in, in light of what we mentioned before, the binary thing is a thinking error. It's a black and white error, you know, thinking error, if you do cognitive behavioral therapy. And, um, but it's been, I think, instituted by design and to control. And I think it's creating awareness about it and finding communities that we can think like that, and think openly, you know, and expanding these communities as these communities merge into other communities, we'll be able to see the change. Um, so yeah, I think it's just about acceptance and openness. Exactly, it's never right or wrong. It's just my perspective, your perspective, somebody's else perspective we all have different lives respect that you know we can all agree to disagree um and it's definitely such just like a political move where we're all fighting against each other without seeing what actually needs to be teared down or rethought of and it's it's such a like Brenda was saying, it's such a, like, it's, it's like putting a veil over our eyes so we can only see what's like right in front of us rather than like the long, long way and like seeing out. And 
I think it's really just about creating more dialogue, not arguing, creating dialogue and really talking to other people and other communities. And like, I respect where you're coming from, you know? And believe in science. <laughs> yes. I'm going to interrupt for one second. second. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt for one second and just let the Facebook people know that if you have a question or a comment or you just want to say something, put it in the chat or in the comments so I can read it because it's quarter to eight and there's a little bit of a lag between what you guys see and Facebook was actually happening in real time. So um, we're going to continue this conversation about binary and then as I see things, I'll stop and, um, and bring them into the conversation. Thanks. But I would love to bring back like the binary between the physical and the mental and the works. I don't know, did you experience that as you created your works, even if it was before? Like, or do you experience that on a regular basis? You know? Can you repeat that? So do I, do we, <laughs> like, can you sort of repeat what you were saying, Andrea? Yes, like the, the, this physicality versus the mental, you know, mm -hmm. like you're doing the work, but the thoughts in your mind, how does that affect your creative process, right? Like this in between, mm -hmm. between the practical and maybe the emotional, mm -hmm. that duality that, you be, and we sit in between, right? Like, yeah, I, um, yeah, okay, that clarifies things. Yeah, I, I'm super emotional. <laughs> I like, whenever I feel something, it definitely portrays that artwork. Um, it's really funny because I think a lot of my works really talk about this in between and my personal experiences to my home and my identity, that whenever I come back to it at a sort of different emotional state, the artwork has a completely different read, um, which I really enjoy. Um, that foreigner sign piece, just a quick story. Um, that foreigner sign piece was made in the summer of 2017, before I knew Trump was going to go into power. And I remember having a little bit pushback. And like, people were like, but Caroline, like, do you do people really see you as a foreigner? And I was like, don't talk about my experiences when you haven't experienced it. Um, and then um, Trump came into power. And all of a sudden, everybody understood like what this was and um it, it was it was actually sort of horrifying for me as an experience because i would rather my pieces be sort of like a mirror to society rather than a reflection like when it became that one-to-one -one reflection um where everybody understood where this is coming from i was like this is horrifying that we are now in a world where everybody understands what this foreigner sign means to me and we are in a state of existence where politically nobody like if people push back on me <laughs> there's so much information that I could literally send you even the news from today that would be able to explain this and so I think like for me it's really interesting to see how my emotional state or sort of the physical state of the world changes these perspectives of my work. Um, yeah, but I mean, that's, it's kind of like an amazing thing that that work kind of went from maybe a more personal reflection of what you experienced to then being this like, now you're actually speaking on behalf of a large group of people that can now relate to it. And that's like, I don't know, that's, that's kind of like an awesome thing. I think that's, I think as an artist, um, you know, that's something that you hope happens with your work. Um, it's, it sucks that it, the given situation, like the subject matter of it, that that's kind of like how it is. But um, in a lot of ways, that's also great because now there's people that can relate and experience that in a, in a a new way that maybe wasn't as you know apparent before. Um, yeah, but I think um, I think for like when I'm thinking of working on my stuff, like I think like the physical and then like the idea of like the mental process of what happens, or like the concepts. Um, that's always something that's like on the front of my mind is like how how is the object, how does the physicality of what I'm making 
relate to either like the content or the idea um, or again kind of like our experience and interactions within digital space like how how can that be translated into some kind of physical form and that's where I like have kind of dabbled a little bit in like augmented reality for that very reason because it like it's like a perfect way to kind of to translate those thoughts um, in certain ways but then also just like you know working with like the flash paint that you're sort of like required to use your phone to then experience the piece that the whole thing kind of exists in two places at once right so you have like the physical painting and then now you have like this digital file that's on your phone that lets you see the text and like you kind of need both of those so like if you just view it in the room without that other experience then it's just like it's it's kind of like half the piece so that to view the whole thing you have to then interact with it in that way um yeah i think for me that's kind of where i i'm always trying to think of like that physical relationship uh whether if it's like what you're looking at or like how you're experiencing it versus where that concept is coming from Andrea, what about your work? How do you sort of, um, does the physicality in your mental space, how does that relate to yours? Well, my work is, it's very material based, you know, and um, so I always wonder, you know, like I almost feel like it's like a, a channeling. And when I put the materials together, like, the performance yesterday you're just there present and you're channeling it and not really thinking about much what's happening but uh but as you're working whatever state of mind is there is going to i guess be translated into the work um so this is the whole series about you know just trying to separate and just let the thoughts be imprinted on the canvas or the work because there's so little other noise out, right? We're not going out, we're not having our normal social interactions and, and responsibilities. So it's like, okay, so I'm trying to make works during COVID that are more pure perhaps, that is just this straight connection and see how this will change my practice perhaps. Just an experiment of the noising the noise in the process. <laughs> I, I like that idea of how your practice might change as we approach eight, because I am the keeper of time. I want to kind of pose that question to Brandon and Caroline. How do you think, has it changed your practice already or how do you maybe anticipate changes? Brandon, you want to go first? Or? Sure. So like to reiterate, so like the question is kind of like, how do, how do I anticipate or react to like changes that may, that might happen within the work? With the quarantine and COVID. I mean, I think the uh, quarantine itself, but then also this, uh, this pandemic and, um, and then dealing with all the civil unrest and everything on top of that, like, um, how has it changed your practice and how do you anticipate it changing your practice or i mean maybe it doesn't change it i don't know mm -hmm. um yeah i mean i know for me like i'm working definitely working from home a lot more than just studio so they have like a studio in downtown but um I, I was working a lot from home prior to that too but uh now it's like i just definitely want to kind of just work on what i can here but what it's kind of like what i'm starting to do is kind of it's weird, like I'll, I'll, I'll uh, get an idea for, for a new, you know, flash painting or something. Uh, I'll create it, get it printed, complete it. And that'll be within like, you know, maybe like half a month, that whole process kind of takes place. And then it's like, I'll go back into just like taking care of like everyday stuff, like life and work. And then, you know, it's almost like I take a, take a break for a minute and then another idea will pop back up and it's like, all right, I got to get a new one done and then I'll create another one. So it's kind of created this weird like ebb and flow of, of creating a new work, completing it, and then taking a moment to take a breather, you know, kind of let things kind of happen naturally and then go right back into it. But it's almost been like this like month on, month on, month off kind of thing or like half a month on, half a month off that I, I found that I'm getting into this kind of weird pandemic routine of like 
working a lot, producing it, finishing it, taking a break, a breather, and then doing another one like a, that following month. That's super interesting because that's like the opposite of my quarantine COVID experience. <laughs> I think, uh, so for me, my work is very much socially engaged. It's very much talking about politics, race, society. Um, and being an Asian American, being an Asian in the West, all of these different things. And when COVID hit, uh, because it had originated from China and all of these racial sort of tensions coming back to the Asian American um, or the Asian in the West, um, not gonna lie, it was terrifying. It was, it was like being back in, like the early 2000s in the middle of nowhere Pennsylvania again where you're just uh there isn't I think this cultural maybe sort of acceptance or acknowledgement that you are different but that's okay um and because the Asian body all of a sudden became um it, it became this sort of violent reminder for America of this pandemic um that was really terrifying and um i know a lot of other um asian western asians living in the west artists who we all sort of fell into this depressive anxiety state where um there were racist slurs there are racist actions being thrown our way just because of the way we looked and because it was um it was because of the political situation and um, I think a lot of us were like trying to work through that. And then as um, the BLM movement resurged and all of these racial tensions really reached sort of like a boiling point, um, it, it's, you just realized um, how hierarchical race is in America and how much that hierarchy based in the white male really controls the whole narrative um and i truthfully wasn't working a lot during i think until probably july um i because i just couldn't i couldn't get to work it, it seemed like what what was the point of my work which was really funny because like a lot of people because i make socially engaged work were like caroline this is like the perfect time for you to like shine like like you're talking about all these things that are you know on topic with all of these points. And sort of like I said before with the sign, which I now realize, the foreigner sign, which I now realize was 2016, because Trump came into power 2016, right, fall. But um, that, it was sort of like that situation again, where I feel like all, like at least a lot of my work until recently has been really engaged on destroying these sort of colonial capitalist um, patriarchal narratives. And when those become your utmost reality, there's not a sense of joy. It's just, oh wow, the world has really come to this point. Um, and, and I think a lot of artists who um, engage in political work, it's not that, of course this moment matters, of course this is important, of course maybe we'll make work that responds to this because they are artists who do that way. But most of our work, if we're politically and socially engaged, has always been talking about this. It's not this moment or this one thing. We have been building to this for eons and eons. And so I think for me, I had to take like a break <laughs> and try to almost find my humanity or the world's humanity again, because that for me was so lacking at that point. Um, I think truthfully going to Korea was really nice for me because it was um, in a way this escape, like this actually physical escape, which I was very privileged to have. I completely understand that, but it was, and of course I was following the news on all of these racial movements consistently, but it was really nice for a moment to be in a country that even though they alienated me in a certain sense, I was still not as alienated as I would be in America.
And I think that was the space that I needed to start to go back into this mind state of, okay, let's create, let's try to produce something. And I was on a track recently, I think earlier this year, where instead of sort of destroying these narratives, I wanted to create more space for people who are other, people who are ostracized in these systems to have space because there really isn't space for us to be embodied if you're other, for example, in Korea, if you're female, there's really no space for you to scream. Like, we're, like in society, can a woman go out and just scream on the streets without being considered hysteric or emotional or like crazy? And it's not. And so it's like creating maybe spaces where we can find healing or processing is something that I was looking forward to and I think I'm still thinking about as COVID and BLM have changed the world. It has just reiterated the fact that these spaces need to be created. Thanks, Caroline. Wow, thank you. It was yeah. very moving and, and real, thanks. Yeah, I, I wish I would have let you go first because <laughs> you're, you're, I think your point was way more, way more on point. Um, it, it also made me realize that like I didn't actually start working until July either. Like I feel like I didn't really do much of anything for like the first like, you know, couple. I don't think anyone really did. Like anyone that was like, oh, quarantine, yes, it's time to start working on studio. It was like no. Like if anything, it makes you question what you're doing in general, like as an artist and everything else. And um, yeah, but I think it's your experience. To sense. Sorry. But, no, I think we all had to make sense of what was going on and process in our own personal ways, right? Like, um, so we all have probably an outcome that we imagine after this that is very personal. So, yeah, no, oh no, working came a few months in. <laughs> I mean, I, I think if, because I've got to wrap it up, but I, I think if nothing else um, from this conversation and even just kind of musings on on our practice and, and how things have changed and how we see things changing is that everything's become a little bit more extreme. Um, I th and like, you know, like Brandon, you were talking about, oh, you work and then you rest and then you work and then you rest. And I, and I do, I, th I think with this group here, you guys didn't start working until later, but I, I do know people who were like, oh, I'm just going to work. And they, that was what they did. But I, but there's always, but there's these extremes. And even though we're here having this conversation about the in-between, I feel like the in-between got smaller as far as just like this idea of work. And I feel like even with a lot of things like sleep or eating or drinking or exercising, like there's been a lot of, or even taking showers daily, there's been a lot of just like, I'm doing that. Yes, I'm on top of that. Or no, I'm not on top of that. And I'm not trying to be on top of that. Um, so anyway, okay, we're going to end. It's 8.03 and I'm sorry, I try to be like my like timekeeper. Um, I want to thank each of you for taking the time out of your day to do this and to do the prep meeting and to talk and for being vulnerable and talking about issues that are, can be hard to talk about, especially publicly. Um, I want to give one more shout out to the Instagram takeovers that are happening by Javier Cáceres Cortes, which is going on right now. It'll be a, be happening until Thursday. And then Jung, Jung, Mok, Jung Mok Yi, who will be starting on Friday, and they'll be there. Everything's four days, so we're going to do that. Um, again, vote. If you can vote, vote. If you can't vote and you know people who can vote, make them vote. And, um, and one last thank you and honor to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg for all of her hard work. Should we say goodbye to Facebook, everybody? Bye, Facebook. All right, see you guys later.